Thank you. So welcome everyone. Uh, so we have to start. This will be our last colloquium in this, let's say, academic year. And this last colloquium will be given by Lorenzo Mattioli. And we have such a custom that um, PhD students, before their defense, they are asked to give a talk such that everyone can uh, appreciate the results and ask uh, difficult questions. Uh, so today is the turn of, of Lorenzo. Lorenzo joined our institute uh, four years ago, correct? Before he was working on the uh, Casimir Polder effects, and then he moved to mathematical physics. He's working with uh, Professor Adam Savitsky. And today he will tell us about universality verification for a set of quantum gates. So Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Krzysztof, for your introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm mostly going to talk about um, a result which we, me and my supervisor uh, have found at the beginning of this academic year. And to be honest, this result was kind of unexpected to us uh, in the sense that we didn't think that a result of this form could exist, or maybe we hoped that it could exist, but it, we didn't expect to have such a uh, generality. Um, this is what I'm mostly going to talk about, also something else, and I uh, hope that at the end of my presentation you you will appreciate the, the simplicity of this result, and uh, despite all the uh, technical details which I'm not uh, going to provide. So yeah, I just hope you will appreciate it. Okay, so more precisely, I'm going to define the, what me and my supervisor and other people call uh, the universality problem in quantum computing. This is the setting. Uh, then I will define the mathematical tool of the commutant, also called centralizer. Uh, I will show that it immediately provides uh, an easy necessary condition. Uh, such that the universal the answer to the to our problem is yes and and then we start from from this point because we don't want just a necessary condition but we would like a full characterization uh, for the universality problem so i will describe two solutions the the, the first solution was actually found by uh, by uh, my supervisor before i joined sefte but during my PhD, um, while reading this, this, uh, the, the proof of the, of the theorem, I realized that there was something incomplete, so we eventually had to work hard, but we fixed the, the proof, so by now we think it should be correct. But then I will go to our second solution, which, as I said, is what I'm, I'm mostly interested in, and it's what I, I think you will also uh, appreciate the most. And then I will just draw simple conclusions. Okay, so we are talking about um, quantum computing and specifically about quantum gate model of quantum computing. So some of you might be familiar, some of you might not, so uh, I can just give you the very fundamentals of, the, of our toy. So <clears throat> Um, you probably have in mind classical computing, so we have, a, we have a bunch of bits which are nothing but variables which can take values of 0 and 1, and we transform our bits by means of what we call logic gates. And this way we do some useful computation, whatever it is. Well, in quantum computing what you do is uh, you replace bits with qubits, which are nothing but a two-level quantum system. Quantum system, so you can think about the hydrogen atom, and you find some way to experimentally operate on the ground state and the first excited state, for example. Of course, this is a very naive picture. This is not what people do in practice. There are more elaborate and sophisticated ways to do this, to, to implement qubits. But if you just want to have a mental picture, here it is. And on the, uh, on the other end, we replace uh, logic gates with uh, quantum gates. And quantum gates are nothing but uh, unitary matrices, 
which modify the qubits. Okay, oh, okay. I didn't say that the qubits live in a two-dimensional uh, vector space, and so they can be described by, by vectors, two-dimensional vectors. So we operate on these vectors by means of these unitary uh, matrices. Okay, so uh, in general, we should specify on how many qubits the quantum gate is acting. So in general, we talk about many qubit gates, but it turns out as a basic fact. I do not fact, see the full screen. Um, so I was saying that um, as a first basic fact in quantum computing, you can actually uh, reduce uh, uh, any many qubit gates into smaller pieces. Okay, you can you can just use a single uh, a fixed uh, two qubit gate. Uh, two qubit gate, we, and usually people use the famous C not gate, but also other ones. And then you should do, you decompose also in terms of all possible uh, one qubit gates. Okay, so many qubit gates equal C not gates plus one qubit, all one qubit gates. And so this means, at least for for our purposes, that we can focus on a single qubit, a single qubit gates. And actually, we slightly genera uh, do an, um, uh, we, we do a. When you are talking about qubit, you mean qubit, yes? Yes, so I'm, that's exactly what I'm going to describe. So I'm moving to qubit now. I just want to, yeah, describe qubit. So usually, what people do many times in, in, in the field is that uh, we can generalize qubits to qubits. So instead of considering two level quantum system, we consider D level quantum system, we, uh, where D is different from two. Like for example, for D equal three, we talk about Q3 and, and so on. Okay, so this is uh, what we do. We consider uh, only one QDIT gates. And now uh, we have an obvious problem uh, that such gates are, uh, they form a, an infinite set and even worse, they are uncountable to very simply in a way you can have them all in your lab. Um, so we, what we can do is that we are just given a finite set of one QDIT gates. We call this set our gate set and we denote it with the letter S. And now the idea is that we can compose all these gates in many infinite possible ways. So we can take, uh, we can combine a thousands of them a ten, uh, just 10 of them and in all possible orders. So the idea is that hopefully by doing this, we can approximate up to arbitrary precision all the other one QDIT gates. If, if it's so, then you say that your gate set is universal, otherwise you say it's not universal. So let's make things uh, mathematically rigorous. Um, first of all, we know from, uh, from basic quantum mechanics that uh, global phases do not matter. So we can multiply any one QDIT gate by a phase, and in particular, we can make its determinant equal to one. What this means is that uh, our gate set is a finite subset of SUD. SUD is just the group of unitary matrices with determinant one. Okay, so now we uh, consider what happens when we perform all possible combinations of such gates and we define this, oops, sorry, and we define this subset here, bracket S. But I said in the informal formulation of the problem that we are actually allowing for uh, approximation of gates, not precise generation. We don't really care if we uh, if a certain gain can be exactly generated or approximated. It's the same for our purposes. So what is- When you say approximation, what is the measure of the distance? Yes, yes, so I'm, go I'm going to talk in the next slide about the distance, exactly, sure. But I'm up to now, this is just topology, okay? So I'm not, I, yeah, of course I, I sh yeah, I should specify a distance. Uh, yeah, so what we do uh, from topology is that we consider the closure of this set, so this bar of bracket S. This is the subset we care about, and it turns out that it is a compact Lee subgroup of SUD. 
Now, you should not be scared by these words. What you should just remember is that such subset has a nice mathematical structure. This is all I care about. And, and hopefully we can use this structure somehow to, uh, to solve our problem. And since it is a nice subset, we call this subset the subgroup generated by S, by the gate set. And so the universality problem is easily statable in the bottom. And I hope that now you can read what, what, uh, what's at the bottom, but I'm going to read it for you. So we can say that the gate set S is universal when the subgroup generated by it is equal to SUD. Okay, that was the statement of the problem. And now as, uh, as the audience was, was uh, wondering, yes, we should define a notion of distance between unitary, between gates. And the, the usual way to do it, since we are talking about matrices, is that we take as the distance, the norm, the matrix norm of the difference of the two gates of the two matrices. And of course, you should still specify which kind of uh, matrix norm you are using. And it turns out that in our first solution, we use the we use the Frobenius norm, which you probably all know about. You have your matrix, you compute the modulus with the uh, square of the modulus for each matrix entry, you sum them all, you take the square root and this is the Frobenius norm. Also called, in fact, in the community, this, this is the uh, usual terminology, Hilbert-Schmidt norm, that, that's true. And, and okay, this, this norm will appear in, in the statement of, of, the, of the first solution, whereas instead in the second solution, not in the statement, but in the proof, so you, you will not be able to see it, but it's, it's just good to know that there is such a norm behind. So for our second solution, we use the operator norm, which is simply uh, the, the, the largest singular value of the matrix. Or if you prefer, you can just use this definition here at the, in the middle. Yes. Yeah, OK. So I said that for the operator norm, S1 is the largest singular value. So uh, the SK are just this all the singular values of the matrix in uh, non-increasing order. Okay. Ah, okay. I got yeah, I mean, for the Frobenius norm, you just, um, you, you take all the singular values, actually. So unless you truncate or you do something strange. So you square them, you sum them all, and you take the square root, and you get the, the same answer as you get with the matrix entries. Okay. So now I should define the center of, of the lead. Yes? No. Okay. You should define the we should define the center of SUD, which we denote with the letter Z. And this is just the set of quantum gates which commute with all the other quantum gates. And it's very simple to see that it's just the set of multiples of the identity, and the multiple in front of the identity is just the uh, uh, complex root of the uh, unit with order D, okay? So if we are talking about SUD, so qubits, this set will be the identity and minus the identity and, and so on and so forth for other values of D. Similarly, we define the notion of commutant, which is, is the most important notion we need. So if we have a linear operator, a matrix, after you choose some basis, you define the commutant of the matrix A as the set of matrices which commute with your matrix A. And if you wonder, can you actually compute it in practice? Yes, we can. So we, instead of computing these matrices X, we compute uh, their vectorizations. So we have, just to remind you, if you have a matrix, you can compute, you can reshape it into its vectorization. What you do is you take all the columns and you stack them one below the other. Okay, so you get this possibly giant vector, and this is the vectorization of the matrix. And of course, it contains the same information as the original matrix. And the rightmost expression here for the definition of the commutant says that uh, you should just solve this linear system of equations. Okay, so this is some object we can compute for, uh, for sure. So, okay, we are fine with this, but what we, if we actually want to compute 
just the dimension of the commutant because eventually this will be what we actually need. So this is a good moment to start talking about representation of, of SUD and in general of any other compactly group if you prefer. Um, so one minute for explaining what a representation is. Um, well, a representation is nothing but a way to transform your quantum gates into other matrices, okay, which in general we will be of uh, a higher dimension, okay, so like, I don't know, uh, for uh, SUD, SU2, you have two by two matrices, and you can transform them into, I don't know, 10 by 10 matrices. Uh, why should you do that? Well, it turns out that, and this is the, the topic of representation theory, that by doing this, you, you can get quite a lot of information and it will be uh, the case for our problem. So I should also say that once you have a representation, any such representation, what you can do is you can decompose it into irreducible components. So to make the story short, you can think that um, you have all these possibly bigger matrices and you can change the basis, the basis, okay? You do a similarity transformation for these matrices. And if you're clever, you can put all these matrices uh, at the same time in block diagonal form and such that these blocks, you cannot further decompose again by means of similarity transformation. So we have these, uh, these blocks pi actually we can even define, instead of talking about blocks, we can talk about kind of blocks uh, in the sense that there is a way to say that two blocks are what people say equivalent irreducible representations, but I will just say that they are the same kind of blocks. So pi is, you can decompose your representation pi into uh, kind of blocks, and it makes sense to talk about uh, the multiplicity, the number of time uh, that this this kind of block appear appears in this in the representation. So this is the uh, quick meaning of, of of this formula here. And if you have this decomposition, you can compute the dimension of the commutant of all the quantum gates after application of the representation with the right hand side. So you take the multiplicities, you square them, you sum them, and this is the dimension you are looking for. Um, maybe I will say that in, in, uh, I, since I will, uh, th this kind of objects here will appear many times, I will just, um, every time I will just say that this is the commutant of whatever it's inside here. And it's implied that you're actually transforming this stuff here by means of, of, of the representation you are choosing, okay? So if I say the, the, the commutant of quantum gates, I actually mean the commutant of the quantum gates after transformation by the uh, representation you choose. And I just do this because otherwise it, it will be boring for you to listen to this all the time. Okay. Yes. Take SU2. Yes. Take, let's say five dimensional representations of SU2. Yes. What will be the this dimension? So if you have like the five irreducible, then it depends if it's yes. you're using an irreducible five dimensional irreducible yes. or a reducible one. Mm -hmm. So in case it's irreducible, of course, this decomposition is trivial. So pi is decomposing to pi and nothing else. So the multiplicity will trivially be one and this dimension will be one, okay? But if you choose, I don't know, the five dimensional representation which decomposes into the two dimensional representation, I mean the fundamental representation, plus the trivial representation, then you will have like the multiplicity of the fundamental one, which will be two, the other which will be one, so two squared is four, one squared is one, so four plus one is five. This dimension will be five. So basically, it depends whether it's reducible or how. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it thank depends. you very much. Of course, of course, sure. Yes. Maybe I have also a stupid question, because this commutant is a set. Yes, it's a set of all matrices that commute with uh, yes. given a. Yes. And it turns out to be actually a subspace. So this dimension of the set, which is at the bottom line of the mm -hmm. slide, 
What does it mean? Is this dimension of... No, no, no. Okay, yes, I didn't say. So the commutant is actually, it turns out to be a, sub, a subspace, a vector subspace. So it makes sense to talk about the, its dimension. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. So once I define the, uh, the commutant, uh, then we have this power, simple and powerful lemma. So on the right-hand side, I have the commutant of the subgroup generated by S. Again, it is implied that you are actually transforming these, these matrices by the representation. But the problem is that the, I cannot compute this right-hand side because in general, I, I cannot really generate mathematically on, 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 with pen and paper. I cannot generate it. I cannot write it down. But the lemma comes to the rescue and says that you can actually compute it with the left-hand side. So you, you shouldn't generate anything. You just take your gate set S and uh, you compute its commutant. Again, the commutant after transformation by the uh, representation. And as an immediate corollary, we get that the gate set is if the gate set is universal, then you have the equality of these two commutants. And this is nice because a commutant of this form, so a commutant of all the quantum gates, this is something we usually know in practice, like uh, uh, to, to link with the previous answer I gave, most of the time, this commutant will just be uh, the set of multiples of the identities. And usually it's not much more complicated. Well, okay, actually at the end of the talk, it would be <laughs> more complicated, but uh, yeah, uh, you can think about it as the multiples of the identity in, uh, in nice cases. So anyway, this is something we know, we, we take it for uh, to be known. And so what we do is we compute the left-hand side, uh, which is the only object we depend on our gate set. And if the two commutant agrees, okay, the necessary condition is satisfied and there is some chance that our gate set is universal. Otherwise you can already say that it's not universal. So we have a necessary condition and can we have a sufficient condition? Actually, can we make the same necessary condition sufficient too? Can we have a, a full characterization of universality? This is the, the question at the, um, which uh, start, raised our, our work. So, um, uh, there is any, any Lie group, and in particular also SUD, as a um, standard representation, which is called a joint representation. So I don't want to bore you with the details, but it's, it is known that you have the Lie group SU2, and you can associate to it its Lie algebra, which you still denote with SUD, but with a different style for the letters. And this Lie algebra is nothing but a vector space with some uh, other operation defined on it which people call Lie bracket, and you essentially, it's essentially uh, the bracket of, of matrices. Uh, and so what uh, the, the joint representation does is it associates to each quantum gate another matrix which acts on the Lie algebra SUD. Okay, so we are just choosing a particular vector space, which, oops, sorry, okay. And the definition is, is as follows. So these matrices A, D, U acts on any matrix in SUD with conjugation. And that's it. Okay, so now if we apply, so the question is, okay, you are specifying some representation. What happens if the necessary condition is satisfied with the adjoint representation? Well, the theorem says that if it does, it, we have a, a very big simplification. We have two extreme cases which can happen. Either we have that the gate set is universal, or we have the um, precise opposite, namely that what is generated by the gate set is finite, is a finite subgroup. Okay, so there's nothing more as far as being universal uh, than a finite subgroup, of course. And so we are, we are very close to getting some, some 
sufficient condition, what we should rule out is the possibility that our, uh, our gate set generates something finite. If we can rule it out, then we are done. And in order to do this, we followed two approaches. Uh, in, in the first approach, we, uh, we still insist with the joint representation. And what we have, to, we have to do is we have to add some other necessary condition. And together, the two necessary conditions turn out to be sufficient too. So we get a necessary and sufficient condition overall. And in the second approach, we actually um, abandon the joint representation and we use some even bigger representation. So let me start with the first approach. Um, I will avoid details here. Um, essentially, we are defining inside of SUD some subset, which we denote with the letter B. And it is defined like this. You take, uh, so we have the center, these few matrices inside of SUD. And these are the dots here in the picture. And we construct balls around them with radius one over square root of two. And the union of these bolts is this subset B. Um, I think the picture might be misleading because in fact, for bigger and bigger values of D, these bolts are closer and closer. And yeah, eventually there, you should not think of them as being disjoint. But okay, for small values of D, this is a, a nice picture to have in mind. And why we have this factor, this radius for the ball of one over square root of two, I won't bore you with the details, but it essentially comes from this couple of lemmas which you can uh, find in the in the literature. Okay, so it's fully justified in a sense. Okay. What is this big dot? Ah, uh, yes, you're right. I actually didn't put any definition for this object. I should have. So this is the. This is not the commutator of the matrices U and V, it's the multiplicative commutator of them. So it is defined like U times V times inverse U times inverse P. Yeah, so it's a multiplicative version of the commutator. And I actually apologize because I, I forgot to write it down explicitly. Okay. So here it's uh, even more technical. So I essentially. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about the details, but the message is that you can define for each subgroup of SUD, like for we, are, we, are, we want to rule out this possibility of a finite subgroup. So, but in general, for each subgroup of SUD, we can define some object which we invented. And this, we call it the auxiliary subalgebra corresponding to this subgroup. Uh, if some of you is familiar with the fact that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between connected Lie subgroup of a Lie group and subalgebras of its Lie algebra. If, if some of you have in mind this picture, this is completely, completely different. Okay, we are doing something very peculiar and ad hoc. So you should not have in mind this picture. But despite this, despite the fact this is a strange object to define, it turns out that it enjoys a nice property. And, and by the way, the introduction of this, uh, this tool is actually what we eventually found in order to solve uh, the bug uh, which was present in the original proof. So it's uh, very nice that we eventually managed to do it. And this is the theorem, the first solution of the universality problem. So it says that the gate set S is universal if and only if we have the uh, we have that the necessary condition is satisfied with their joint representation again, but then we are adding some other condition. So if you want to understand it, just look at the picture here. So I said that we cannot actually generate completely the subgroup generated by S, but we can start generating uh, a bunch of gates at least. Uh, so I don't know, we start considering uh, all products of two of such gates, or maybe of three, and so on. And by doing this, if at a certain moment, it happens that some of these dots, some of the gates we generate, fall 
inside uh, the, these balls, they, if they fall inside uh, our subset B, and moreover, they fall inside, but they, are not, they don't fall precisely uh, coincident with the center, with the centers of the balls, then the second condition is satisfied. And if the first condition and the second condition are satisfied, when we have that the gate set is universal. And the proof is actually very short. I don't want to uh, get you bored with the details, but the very fact it is short, it's precisely because we introduced this auxiliary subalgebra, which eventually turns out to be very useful. Okay, and now I move to the second solution, to the second approach. So, as I said, we want to abandon the adjoint representation. So which representation we, we choose? Well, usually in representation theory, when people don't really know what to do, well, they take some representation they know, and they consider the tensor products of the, ten the tensor. Well, you should specify the order, of course, or in which you perform the tensor products, but you can tensor product them, and automatically you get some new representation. And, and this is also what we do. We didn't know which representation to choose, so we, uh, we tried this simple uh, approach. Specifically, what we do is we take a quantum gate. For, for any quantum gate, we consider its tensor power with exponent t1. Uh, then we complex conjugate it. So this bar here at the top, it's just complex conjugation. And this corresponds to what is called the dual representation, but whatever. And so we compute the tensor power of it with exponent t2. We have these two matrices, and we finally tensor them in, in the order we, it is written in the bluish box. And this is the tensor representation we are considering. Um, of course, we have infinite of them, because we should specify which exponents t1 and t2 we choose. And the bulk of, of our work was actually was, was indeed to find the uh, the correct uh, exponents. I mean, the exponents which which uh, solve our problem. Uh, in the few remaining slides, I'm using this notation. So previously, for the joint representation, I was using the basic notation like add of s. And here, instead of writing all the time pi of pi with indices t1, t2 of s, I just write s t1 comma t2. Okay, so these are the quantum gates after transformation by this tensor representation. And if the second exponent is zero, we actually omit it and we just write s uh, exponent t. Okay, I'm actually, I'm essentially going to skip <laughs> Uh, almost all the proof because it's honestly uh, a bit complicated and it would add it wouldn't add much to 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 the picture but i will just give you the the very few uh, very first step which are not that complicated it's just a bunch of linear algebra after all so um you know that you can transpose any matrix but maybe you some of you might not know that if you fix some partition of your matrix, some block partition of your matrix, then you can transpose each of the blocks individually, independently. And if you do this, you say that you are partial transposing the matrix. Of course, you should specify which uh, partition you are considering, but this is actually, in our case, this is actually implicitly, def uh, implicitly defined by um, by the tensor representation, in the sense that we have some uh, matrix here on the left, so it acts on some vector space, and then we have some matrix here on the right, which is acting, acting on some other uh, vector space, and their dimension fix the, the partition of, of the matrices uh, on which this full representation acts. So now the question is, what we can do with this partial transpose, well, we can partial transpose uh, our matrix and we can also conjugate it, okay? So this operation here, U and U dagger um, is conjugation indeed, like with the joint representation. 
And the question is, um, what happens if I exchange this operation? Do they commute? Well, they don't commute, but almost in the sense that if you change exchange order of operation, on the left hand side, you should, uh, you should conjugate with the representation with exponents t1, comma t2. And on the right hand side, you should conjugate with the representation with exponent t1 plus t2. And please remember that the second exponent is zero, given that it is implied. And yes, so essentially there is some, let's say some uh, manipulation which we can do with exponents of these tensor representations. And it follows immediately that uh, if you compute the commutant of the gate set with representation t1 plus t2 and the commutant of the gate set with representation t1 comma t2, they are actually related by means of transpar partial transposition. So if you compute one of them, you partial transpose the matrices of the commutant, which you get, and you get it for free, the, uh, the other commutant. And that's a corollary, and this is all we actually need in the proof uh, for, for this kind of, of algebra, is the fact that the dimension of the commutant of the gate set with indices t1, comma t2, it actually depends only on their sum, not on t1 and t2 individually. And yes, this is all the only part of the proof I wanted to highlight, so I immediately jump into the statement of the second solution. So it says that the gate set is universal if and only if these two commutants agree. So there is no second condition as we had in our first solution. What we do is that um, we transform the gate set with, represent with, with some tensor representation with, uh, with exponents td, td, uh, which is a function of, of the dimension d of the uh, qubits, qtrits, and so on. And you do the same with all the quantum gates, not just those of the gate set. And if the commutants you get are the same, then you know that the gate set is universal. And finally, and this is the main point of the theorem, the uh, exponents which uh, do the trick are the following. So for d equal to, so for qubits, this exponent is 3. For all the other values of d, the exponent is 2. So it seems that qubits are kind of uh, particular among all uh, possibilities. So why is 2 for all other dimensions? Why this number is 2? Um, How to understand this? Well, it's, it's not easily understandable, to be honest, because the point is that this, in fact, this, the, the value of this uh, exponent comes from this paper here. Uh, they are giving these exponents for some different problem. They are actually doing, as far as I remember, some classification task in group theory. It's, it's honestly something very advanced, which uh, me and my supervisor don't fully understand. Uh, but it turns out that there are such exponents, and we were able to um, massage this mathematics in order to... But we don't need to be ashamed that we don't see why it is true. Yes, exactly. You, you shouldn't, because to be honest, we also don't. It's but something that we, we don't understand. It's kind of magic, to be honest. But, uh, are you sure that it is the only choice of these exponents? It has to be for... So I uh, it has to be three, or maybe there is maybe possibility bigger. that there are other exponents. We so I, I think I'm not sure, but I think if you start from these exponents and you consider even bigger, it still works. But if you take um, uh, yes, if you take for qubits two, it won't work. So this is the lower bound. Basically. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. These are the lower bound, precisely. But well, the idea is that if you consider higher values. Um, essentially, you will decompose this representation into sub-representation, and uh, eventually you will have some part of this decomposition with, with the, which correspond to this lower bound. So this is the kind of idea behind. So yes, this suggests that if you take higher values, it will still work. But the point is that you, well, since these are big matrices, you, there is no point in, in, in making these exponents. Uh, I. So just go for the lower bound and, and that's it. 
Okay. And so now, well, I just miss uh, one thing, namely the fact that uh, it's it's sim This is a simple statement, namely this commutant on, on the right hand side is contained in, into this. This is always true. And so instead of writing, instead of checking that these two commutants are equal, you can just ask if their dimensions are equal. So yeah, we are uh, moving into uh, some dimension calculations. And uh, what I do now is that I apply the formula I showed to you at the very beginning. So um, we decompose the representation with these funny indices, these funny exponents. We get some multiplicity, we square them, we sum them, and we get the dimension of the commutant. Okay, so we define, uh, yeah, this is the object we have to calculate. We give it a name, namely the function c of d. And well, for qubits, this is actually something you can do easily by yourself, I would say, if you more or less know some basic of representation theory. And you get these exponents 1, 5, 9, 5, and overall you get this dimension. 130t, which is pretty big. But then are ready for Q treats, namely for d equal 3, you get that this dimension is equal to 23, much better. And then you have this convergence of the dimension. So we, I mean, for higher values of d, uh, this dimension converges to, to 24. And so you should not compute infinite values of the dimension. We just get this this uh, uh, limit value for free by means of this formula which you find on on textbooks and so overall this is uh, our second solution in its final form the gate set is universal if and only if the dimension of the commutant of your gate set transformed with this representation is equal to this dimension here and again, these uh, exponents are, are the same as before. We just add the values for the dimension. And I would say that, uh, like, we have this um, behavior that for qubits we get something different. In here, we get something different for qubits, qtrits, and all the other values. But maybe for qubits, we have a big value. So I, I still would say that qubits are peculiar in some way that we don't fully understand. Because as I said, all this comes uh, at, at, at the end of the proof, you will have to use this deep theorem in the literature. And so we, yeah, we <laughs> just don't precisely know what's going on behind. Um, in conclusion, we have solved our problem in two ways, uh, either via uh, a small representation, the adjoint representation, but then we have to add an additional condition or via a big representation, namely these tensor uh, representations. Well, a very specific tensor representation for each of the value of, of, D, of the dimension D. I understand that you might be disappointed by the fact that we don't fully understand this theorem we are using for deriving these exponents and these dimensions. But I want to let you know that, in fact, if you only care about um, universality for qubits and qtreats, so for d equal 2 and d equal 3, in fact, you can fully avoid that argument and you can use the classification of finite subgroups of SU2. So the point is that uh, the classification of this of finite subgroup of SU2 is well known since like a century, as far as I remember. And for the for SU3, um, it's uh, to our understanding, it's not clear uh, what we know, but uh, there are tables and much has been done in recent years. So overall, what you do is you consider all these finite subgroups one by one, and you use the informations characterizing these finite subgroups to derive this, uh, this value here of 132. Well, OK, uh, it's even enough to just derive this so t2 equal 3 and t3 equal 2. of course you you will not know that td is equal to 2 also for all the other values of d but at least you you get the first two very important values in which are very important in in practice 
And that's it. I thank you for your attention and I welcome any question from your side. So thank you for the talk. And now we have time for questions. Yes, so I will have two if possible. First of all, I'm very, very, very much enthusiastic about your results. I like them very much. But let me make a very concrete questions. Yes. I understood that qubits are in some sense even so easier than qubits. So let, I, let us yeah. fix d equal to 3 and ask, yes, yes. what is the smallest set of those gates you can prove it's universal? How many different gates you have to take in such a case? Like three gates, seven gates, uh, eight? No, no, I think you can take two. And we, it, okay, but do you think or you can prove, you can explicitly give me example of two matrices of size three which do the job? Okay, so, okay, I understand the question. So for qubits, we know that two are, are fine because you take Adam Arden T gate and, and, you are, and they're universal. So I'm for, asking about qubits. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. So I'm getting to the point. For qubits, I honestly don't know, but it's known, and this is a general statement in Lie group theory that, um, you can generate all compact semi-simple Lie groups with just two uh, yes. groups. On the other hand, if people. you work so hard to describe all the set, it would be nice to have a concrete mm -hmm. example, yeah, yeah, yeah. size three and four, yes, just yes, for yes. those who possibly might think of realizing it in an experiment. Does the fact whether D is a prime number or not plays any any role in your considerations. For instance, if you take n equal five, it's a prime number. If D is six, there is a subgroup of SU two times SU three. Yes, yes. It does it make any role for your considerations? No, in our proof it doesn't. Nothing. Nothing. So six is as good as five and as seven. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, prime numbers are not important somehow. <laughs> <laughs> A very simple question, uh, maybe not necessarily addressed to you, but to all the audience. Uh, in this quest to build a quantum computer, is anybody using something else but qubits? So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so these people introduce qubit not just because of mathematical generalization, but because, in fact, there are some proposals for using qubits, I think, but then I, I doubt that people use d equal four i. But then I, I I don't know exactly what these proposals are all about uh, for qubits. So I think all more expert people should <laughs> comment on this. I think yes. there are no real uh, attempts. To, uh, attempts maybe there are, but there, there are no constructions which work. Yeah, probably there are no constructions. Yes, yes, that's true. We have a question from our online audience. So Rafa Demkovic, please. So uh, hi. So I, I was I was just wondering because I, I maybe missed it, but it was crucial that you consider this representation with this conjugate use because you at some point you showed equivalence between dimensions of commutants of this T one comma two and T one plus T two. So couldn't you just formulate all the theorem with this? simple representation without this conjugation no no you exactly uh, having the conjugation is is crucial for our purposes yes so yes. where does it uh, so 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 why because you showed this equivalence at some point no uh, you mean like this ah, yes this one yes okay yes so this mm -hmm. doesn't do the job yes if you don't take the complex conjugate it won't work as far as we know and moreover, having the complex conjugate is useful because it's it's physical in the sense that, um, well, if okay, uh, eventually I showed to you that t1 is equal to t2, like it's three or two, whatever, but it's it's t1 equal to t2, and this is nice because if these exponents are the same, then if you transform each matrix, uh, if you multiply each uh, each gate by a, a phase then the phase cancel because you will have you know because the exponents are the same so so in fact i would say that you have a reason a priori to consider t1 equal to t2 uh, and so a reason to consider the complex conjugation but i just wanted to be very general and then mm -hmm. showing that they should be the same yes yes okay. but yeah but you should you could be more specific since the very beginning indeed are there any other questions if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>